so uh, the actual part that we're working on you wouldn't see. It's the, uh, it's the control algorithm. So our contribution to this three component system is in the smarts of the system that makes the decision as to how to dose insulin and glucagon given a particular glucose signal. And that signal is going to come from a continuous glucose monitor. So our technology sort of is sandwiched in between these two different components, the input signal, which is the glucose measurement, and the output signal, which is the insulin and, and glucagon dose. So the actual components might not look different, although over the course of several years, which is how long it would take to develop um, a system that could be commercially available, I'm hoping these technologies will get a little slicker and they'll be a little bit more compact and they'll look much more like a typical smartphone mobile device that we use today where there'd be one central controller that you could fit in your pocket that would receive uh, radio frequency from a transmitter that would have your, would provide your glucose signal and then it would automatically and through wireless transmission talk to a sensing limb either by way of uh, traditional you know, tubes from a pumping system to an infusion set and deliver insulin and glucagon under the skin, or it would talk to some kind of a patch pump like the Omnipod system where it would talk to one or two pods, or a pod with two chambers in it, one filled with insulin and one filled with glucagon. So essentially there's a mathematical theory behind controlling dynamical systems, and in the very broadest sense it's referred to as control theory. And there are a number of different strategies that mathematicians and control theorists have developed to control dynamical processes. Some are better suited to some dynamical processes than others. And diabetes is, has its own challenges with regard to uh, different, differing time scales. So you need to check your blood glucose frequently, but your actions take a long time. So you have these very different disparate time scales. So when you act by dosing with insulin, it takes a long time because it's administered subcutaneously. It, it takes a long time for that insulin to be effective and to, to, to rise up in the blood plasma and then be effective at lowering your blood sugar. So you need to sample blood glucose frequently and you need to then give insulin, which happens, which operates on a much slower time scale. So with those kinds of, with that kind of insight into the, into the dynamical system, certain control theor theories work, certain, cert certain uh, control strategies work better than others. And we happen to cho chosen uh, model predictive control as a method for, for, for uh, regulating blood glucose. There are a number of other strategies. Many of them can be made to work. I think some fit more naturally into this if the context is problem than others. But a great deal of research has gone into studying control theory. We've been controlling dynamical processes for decades. And engineers are quite good at this. And this is not any different in the sense that it is a dynamical process that we want to try and clamp to a, to a set point or to some, some very tight glycemic range. So we have a lot of experience doing these kinds of things. It's just that it's a biological process that we need to regulate. And we're using a substance which is very, very dangerous. It's insulin. And insulin has a very high toxicity index. So it's very understandable that you'd be concerned about the safety and efficacy of a, of a mathematical formulation, which is really what it is, of a strategy for minimizing glucose excursions around some set point value. Um, but that, this is the purpose of clinical trials, right? So we use the theory that's, a, that's, that's time tested in, in, the in, in industries, in, in all kinds of applications, applied now to this process. And then we run you know, extensive clinical studies, first starting out with small feasibility studies like the ones we're doing now, and then graduating to a bridge study or a pilot study with more subjects, and then ultimately to a pivotal study where you have multi-center sites uh, testing the same device in, a, in a, you know, a control group and an experimental group, and you get the statistics to show efficacy and safety of the system. So we, we had anticipated really good response to glucagon in humans because we saw such fast response in pigs. So we tested the glucagon first in the pigs. And um, we did see that that translated very well to humans. And in fact, humans absorb subcutaneously injected glucagon much faster than they do insulin. But with the pigs, the pigs absorb insulin much faster than humans do too, or at least it's people with type 1 diabetes, much faster than people with type 1 diabetes. So um, they have an autoimmune disorder, and that can, we think that can interfere with insulin absorption, slow it down. So the pigs that we studied did not have an autoimmune disorder, and were therefore potentially going to show faster absorption rates. They are faster on average than our cohort of subjects of type 1 that we've studied. Um, and we thought that might also be impacting glucagon, so that we went to humans and tested glucagon in humans, 
you know, we could also see slow, potentially see slow absorption. We didn't see that. We saw very fast absorption in humans, much, much faster than, than with insulin. And that was encouraging. I only wish insulin was absorbed as fast as glucagon. But um, that was an encouraging finding. Um, we also found that we use much less insulin under closed loop control to get the same or better control than people typically do under open loop therapy. We have a number of ideas about why that might be. But one thing that was very disheartening that we learned about was how varied insulin absorption is in people with type 1 diabetes. So we found that I mentioned this in my talk. People showed insulin absorption rates of uh, 45 to 50 minutes, and, and others up to, to three hours, literally. Three hours absorption you know, after a single injection of insulin. And we also found that in these very same subjects, those that absorbed insulin quickly and those that absorbed it slowly, up to a 50% variability within the same subject. So we found a four-fold variability between subjects and up to a 50% variability within the same subject. We have some ideas about why this might be the case. It's more difficult to explain the intrasubject variability, although we also have ideas about that. But the very fact that it exists makes the whole control problem much more challenging because the subject themselves is a moving target. And um, what the controller is assuming about your insulin absorption, which it, it does in fact make assumptions about how fast insulin is absorbed in you, um, the, the, that assumption is challenged uh, by the fact that, that we know that there, there's a lot of variability within the same subject and from subject to subject. The controller is robust enough to handle quite a bit of variability and still do a very good job. But nevertheless, it's a challenge and it's a disappointment that we see such variability. And uh, in fact, what we would like to see is better at insulins develop that are faster, more quickly absorbed, and have less variability from subject to subject. In fact, the apps, the percent variability could be just the same if we could get the insulin to just simply be faster. Mm -hmm. And then the, the absolute variability would be going down, or the absolute uh, variation over which we'd have to deal with under closed control would go down. So I think the one important objective um, and a message that needs to go out to the pharmaceuticals if they don't already know it is that faster acting insulins are going to be critical to improving the standard of care of people type 1 diabetes under open loop therapy and closed loop therapy. So what we're doing now is our second phase in, in hospital clinical study testing our system. And with each phase along the way, we're adding progressively more realistic, uh, more, more realistic environment. And that includes um, exercise, a two-day study, is a, you know, multi-day study as opposed to a one-day study. And um, we have a continuous glucose monitor driving the controller versus our first study where we had blood glucose driving the controller. Uh, subjects are able to get up and walk around more easily. And um, these are all you know, necessary progressive steps before you can leave the hospital. Our last inpatient study, which we're in the planning stages of now, will be five days in duration. Subjects will have even more mobility, and they'll be actually wearing the mobile device and interfacing with it. So one of our next important steps is to, in fact, um, get the subject working with the closed-up system and start sorting out some of the human factors issues that are going to be studied. And up till now, the subjects haven't been much involved with the actual control system that's been running on a laptop, and the nursing staff and the clinical staff have been responsible for that. The subject has not much been interacting with that device. In our next study, they'll be interacting with the, with the artificial factors. They'll actually be you know, interfacing with it. And we're going to learn a great deal about human factors around this whole problem.